First, let me thank you for inviting me to share my thoughts with you. And I must state in advance that I'll not talk about myself at all. It is very difficult to ask one to talk about oneself. But I'll share my thoughts with you as a Kenyan and as an African. I want to preface my conversation with you out of a book that I first read in 1979. I have not read the book since, but I remember the book very well. This is a book written by one of the great Greek writers, Sophocles. It contains three books or three plays which are very famous and which I believe you should know. And if you do not know them, I believe that you will find out where they are and read them this evening. The three plays are Antigone, Oedipus at Colonus, and Oedipus. I have faith that you have read those famous plays written long before the birth of Christ. And I want to preface, as I said, what I want to say with a conversation that takes place in the book of Oedipus. Oedipus is a Greek legend, and it is recorded in that book that it was prophesied by the oracle of Apollo that Oedipus would kill his father and marry his mother. And when he was born, the parents threw him into the wilderness that the prophecy may not come to pass. Unknown to them, the little boy was picked up by somebody and brought up. And in his adulthood, he heard about the story. And he tried to run away from home. And as he was running away, he met an old man and killed the old man. Little did he know that that was his father. Of course, the story then says that he went into the kingdom of Thebes. And he saved the city by solving a riddle. And the prize was that he was allowed to marry the dead king's wife. Little did he know that the dead king's wife was his mother, Jocasta, his father having been King Laius. Then tragedy started striking in Thebes. People were dying. Bad things were happening and he himself decreed that whoever found out what killed the king would be exiled from the land. And of course, one of the seers of Apollo said that he was the one who had committed the crime. And he was exiled. And what I wanted to speak about is to be found in the last portion of that play. When Oedipus has been removed out of his city, he's been exiled, and as he goes out, the commoners who are commentating on the play says, Behold, sons and daughters of Thebes. This was Oedipus, the greatest of all men. He was envied by all men. Behold, what a tide of misfortune swept over his head. Then learn that mortal man must always look to his ending, and none can be called happy until the day that he dies and carries his happiness to the grave in peace. Why did I want to cite that? That is equally true that none can be called successful until the day that he or she dies and carries his success to the grave in peace. As long as we are alive, 
Any claim that we are successful is not only arrogant but misguided. For the moment what we appear to be doing is that we are on the right path. And what you should do is to pray that we should continue to be on that path. History has demonstrated times without number that men whom we thought to be successful betray you at the 11th hour. And therefore, ours is to be humble. I'm still with you in Greece. In those days of Sophocles, there also lived a great man, Socrates, of whom you know much. It is recorded that the oracle of Apollo wanted to determine who was the wisest man in Greece. And he sent out one of his oracles to go out in Greece and determine who was the wisest. In those days, Greece was known for many great things. The great writers of the time. If it was not Sophocles, it was Aristophanes. If it was not Aristophanes, it was Socrates or somebody else. When the oracle went out, the oracle came back and said that the wisest man in Greece was Socrates. And the only reason why the oracle arrived at that conclusion was when Socrates was asked, what do you know? He said, the only thing that I know is that I know nothing. <laughs> it is his humility that set him apart as the wisest man in Greece. So I too come here by saying the only thing that I know is that I know nothing. But progressively and consistently I tried to understand my environment and this started very early on when I was a student. Nowadays I see students of Nairobi University. I was in 1984 and 1985 the chairman of the students organization of Nairobi University. And when I campaigned to be the student I did not spend a single cent. Today I hear that students spend 10 million and I, I wonder why. In other words, I'm trying to say that there is an ethic which is perverted, which now controls not only our country but our people. Last year, I was in Dar es Salaam. I was invited to Dar es Salaam to help some of my colleagues there with the constitution which will be subjected to referendum in Tanzania next month, hopefully. And as I was traveling at the Julius Kambarage Nyerere International Airport in Dar es Salaam on my way back to Kenya, I had my bag. I had liquid in my bag. I wanted to check it in, to carry it on rather. But they told me I had to check it in, it was not padlocked. I went to a young man who was selling padlocks. And I told him I wanted a padlock and he asked me in Kiswahili, Unaendo apyuko? And I said, Nailekia jijini Nairobi. I said, ah, wa Kenya, wezi hao, nunua kufulimbili. That tells you the image of Kenyans that is out there. Several years ago I was in Zanzibar under Tanzanian minister in his unguarded moment was speaking and he said Hili swala la jumuiya Afrika Mashariki ni swala nzuri sana. Kwanza itapanua soko ito awezesha wana wa Afrika Mashariki kusafiri lakini kitu kinacho tuogopesha ni wa Kenya <laughs> kwanza kabisa hawana nidhamu siasa zao ni duni na za kikabila tuna hofu ya kwamba wakiingia katika Afrika Mashariki watatuambukiza ukabila. Jambo la pili ni walafi. 
na wanapenda sana ardhi tayari wanaimezea mate ardhi yetu you may not and in fact you are not supposed to like what i'm telling you but i'm trying to tell you that that is the image that we have out there on our side what image do we have of tanzanians lazy and polite polite equally of tanzanians or ugandans but the question is we claim to be a christian country 80% christians but whenever i go to church on sunday when the congregation is invited to take the holy communion and their reverence here they tell the congregation we are in the house of god but ladies carry your bags because there are people who may still even in church we still i said at one time in mombasa that we live in a country where we profess the blood of christ but in truth the blood of ethnicity is thicker than the blood of christ because when the chips are down it is our ethnicity that counts not our christianness you young men when you are communicating via twitter via facebook and other media the venom that you spew out in the name of ethnicity is appalling and worrying the question is who are your role models today there is a culture in this country which i call the sunkonization culture the youth have been sunkonized and i'm creating this word deliberately what is sunkonization sunkonization is the process of acquisition of material wealth by means that are unknown and unfathomable once it has been so acquired is to distribute that wealth with abject abandon in order to entice the people whose only desire is to acquire wealth by whatever means today that is what dominates in this country and what dominates in africa and one of the most difficult things to be in Kenya today is to be truthful and to be honest if you speak the truth and if you are honest it is very difficult to survive in Kenya and in Africa our indiscipline as a people and as a population is manifested in our roads it is manifested in our markets it is manifested everywhere we see it with our lead